Hello, this is Dr. Ross, and this is the video lecture for the language of anatomy for uh, my class and Dr. Camp's Anatomy and Physiology 1 class. <clears throat> So this lecture will introduce the language of anatomy, describe anatomical position, describe directional terms, and locate body regions. These concepts will be reinforced with activities or quizzes that are located on Blackboard, so please make sure you do those. The purpose of using um, anatomical terms or correct anatomical terms is not uh, to confuse even though these these this language this new type of language can be confusing the purpose of this is to increase precision to improve communication between practitioners and to reduce ultimately to reduce medical errors by using precise anatomical termination uh, terminology we're going to eliminate ambiguity so <clears throat> There are two naming styles in anatomical terminology, um, and one of the naming styles uses either, um, either uh, words derived from Greek or Latin. And these words will consist of a root word um, that's attached to either a prefix or a suffix. So for example, here we have the term brachial, brachial region. This refers to the arm. If we add the prefix anti onto that, we change that. So anti, that prefix means before. So antibrachial is the forearm. Adipo means fat. And if we add the suffix site on there, which means cell, then we know we are talking about a fat cell. Kidney can be referred to uh, is in, uh, in two different ways, <clears throat> and you'll hear this um, in Anatomy and Physiology too. You have renal, which is the Latin uh, word we'll use for kidney, or nephro, which is often used for uh, some of the structures located within the kidney, and that is a Greek origin. <clears throat> Another naming style is eponyms. These are typically, uh, or these are named after the discoverer. So when the structure or part um, is named after the scientist or doctor who discovered it. Um, these are not particularly helpful. Um, examples are the Haversian Canal or the Volkmann's Canal. Uh, these are in bone. If I didn't tell you that, you may have no idea what these canals referred to. Uh, and then the eustachian tube, which is found in ears. Again, if you hadn't heard this term, uh, there's no reason to assume that had anything to do with the ears. So those named after Greek and Latin are typically very helpful. Uh, the eponyms, not so much. And we are actually working on replacing a lot of these eponyms with new terms <clears throat> uh, that are much more meaningful and helpful. So uh, the counterpart to the language of anatomy is the anatomy itself, okay? So in this class, we like to start out with the external anatomy, which is quite large. So it's been broken down into regions and locations. This isn't uh, completely dissimilar to a butcher diagram showing where the different beef products are located uh, when still part of the cow. A similar chart could be made uh, for humans as well, as you can see on the right. This chart might be somewhat useful for a cannibal, but for a medical professional, we still need a lot more detail uh, than just the parts of the muscles and the, the meat they could be used for. So anatomical regions are much more numerous, and we need to know, uh, in addition to that, which side of the individual we're describing. So before we start talking about the different anatomical regions, let's start with anatomical position. So anatomical position is a standardized way to refer to the body, uh, and this increases precision. So when we're talking about the body uh, to another medical practitioner, we want to make sure we're all referring to it in anatomical position. So you can think of this like a map. Of course, um, we can orient a map in any direction we want, but what we tend to do is make our map where north is on top and south is on bottom. So the anatomical position is kind of like a map of the body. So in this case, we have uh, the person as shown here. They are going to be standing upright. Their head will be facing forward. Their arms will be slightly out and at the side with the palms facing forward. The feet will be spaced slightly apart, and the toes will be facing forward. 
Using this standard position again is there to reduce confusion. It doesn't matter how the body is being described, how the body being described is oriented, sorry. Um, so these terms are going to be used as if the person you are describing is in anatomical position, even if they are not. So the entire human body is divided up into regions, and these regions have specific terms to help increase precision. Once again, this is all about uh, decreasing ambiguity and helping improve communication. You'll be able to describe the body's regions using terms from the figures in your text. You need to be able to do this. Now, I realize that at first glance, this may seem like a lot, but once you actually start looking through these terms, you'll find that many of them sound familiar. So for example, the nasal, vertebral, gluteal, and pubic uh, regions are all words you've already heard. And had I not pointed at these, you probably could have guessed these locations just from these words alone. <clears throat> Knowing these terms will also help make future sections of this course easier, much easier. So for example, many bones and muscles have names that have um, their anatomical region in them. For example, the biceps brachii is located within the brachial region. The femur is located in the femoral region. So knowing these terms is going to help you significantly uh, when it comes to learning all the muscle names or when it comes to learning the bones and where those bones are located. Learning anatomical direction or directional terms are also uh, important. They are kind of like the directions or the compass on a map. Um, so just like north, south, east, and west, directional terms can be used to describe the location of structures on a body in relation to other structures or locations on the body. Uh, this is going to be really helpful for this course, um, but it's also helpful uh, when describing an injury or a place of pain on a patient. So starting here with anterior and posterior, anterior means toward the front. It can mean the front of the patient, but it can also mean more towards the front of the patient. Posterior um, can mean toward the back or the back of the patient. Um, these may also be referred to as ventral or dorsal. Superior means the part is above or closer to the head. So something that is above another part is going to be superior, or if it's closer to the head, obviously it's superior. Inferior is going to mean the opposite. This is going to mean the part or area that you're describing is below another part or area or towards the feet. Okay, these can also be referred to as cranial or caudal. So let's do a couple examples. The toes are anterior to the heels. The toes are closer to the front of the body than the heels are, so they are going to be anterior. The chin is blank to the nose. The chin is inferior to the nose. It is below the nose or closer to the feet. The forehead is superior to the mouth because it is above the mouth. It's closer to the top of the head. They're both on the head, um, but one is going to be closer to the top than the other. The spine is blank to the navel. It's posterior to the navel. It's closer to the back of the patient than the navel, so it is posterior. Um, so we have a couple other ones. So here let's start with medial and lateral. Medial refers to the imaginary midline that divides the body into equal left and right halves. Okay, so you would think the nose is medial to the eyes, right? It's right in between. The nose is basically on that midline. Now, proximal and distal, these two terms are almost always used in reference to relative location um, of parts or places on the limb, so on the arms and legs. Proximal is going to describe a region on the arm or leg that's closer to the point of limb attachment, while distal will describe something further from the point of attachment, so something closer to the hand or the foot is going to be distal. So let's go through some examples. The arm is lateral to the torso. Okay. 
The knee is, comparing the knee and the hip, the knee is distal to the hip. The knee is closer to the foot than the hip, so it's distal. The nose is medial to the cheek. The nose, like I said, is right there on the midline, so of course it's going to be medial to the cheek. The elbow is proximal to the wrist. The elbow is closer to the point of the arm's attachment to the body than the wrist is, so it's going to be proximal. The shoulder is lateral to the sternum. So the sternum runs right in between uh, the breast area, right, right down, it's basically right down the midline again, so it's going to be, um, the shoulder is going to be lateral to the sternum. The cheek is medial to the ear. So the cheek is closer to that midline of the body than the ear is, so it is medial. So the last set of directional terms have to do with um, um, depth going into the body, not just along the surface. So in this case, we're talking about the two terms superficial and deep. The closer um, an area is to the surface of the body, to the skin, the more superficial it is. The further into the body it goes, the deeper it is. So for example, the skin will be more superficial than the muscle, the muscle will be more superficial than the bone, okay? Or, said another way, the bone is going to be more deep than the muscle, and the muscle will be more deep than the skin. Okay, so let's use a couple examples. The skin is blank to the abdominal muscles, so the skin is going to be superficial to the abdominal muscles. The humerus bone is blank to the arm muscles, so the bone is going to be deep to the arm muscles. So this uh, uh, concludes this first video here on language of anatomy, so please proceed to the participation and activities associated with this video lecture. Thank you.